Uh, good afternoon, Brett. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was going to say good morning, but I got bumped to after lunch, so it is now afternoon. Um, my name is Brett Sims. I am the Executive Director of the Office of Asset Enterprise Management, or OAEM, if you hear that term. Uh, I work in the Office of Management at the VA Central Office here. My predominant role in the West LA engagement is the EUL program, which falls under me and management of that program. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, there were actually some very specific questions that the board wanted me to talk about today. Um, so when, if you go to one more slide, you'll see those four questions. Uh, these relate to essentially the arrangement that VA has with the principal developer uh, and specifically within the MOU and the EUL that was signed with them. And so I will do my best to answer specifically the questions, but I think as everyone knows here, this is part of a much bigger conversation on the entire North Campus and how the town center, the community plan, all of that comes to fruition. So I will add some additional context as we go through this that uh, hopefully will be informative. Um, I also know that there will likely be a lot of questions when I get to the end, so I will keep my slides brief at the key points and then certainly open it up for questions at the end to go from there. Um, before we get into this, I do want, um, Rob, you had mentioned at the very beginning of this, the recommendation related to 408. Uh, you will see that in the principal developer presentation later this afternoon. The timeline for 408 is slid to the right. Um, not getting in front of the secretary's response to the actual recommendation, but just realistically, the timeline is no longer the spring of 24 for us to make the decision on that. It is pushed into 25, and you'll see that update when the PD does that. It's still in pre-development, so we're still working in that piece of the, the world there, but it is something that maybe doesn't have quite the urgency it did originally. Okay. Um, so I've got one slide on each of these, and I'll talk through it, and then we'll get to the end and open it for questions. So next slide, please. So the first one has to do with what are the agreed targets for construction of permanent supportive housing? So within the principal developer EUL, we have an agreement to make at least 900 units available. Uh, first question you might ask is, why is that not 1,200 units? Well, the answer is, is the principal developer is not developing all of the housing on campus. There are two other development teams that are working on or have already delivered housing. The Shangri-La Step Up is building 205, 8, and 9, and Core Companies is working on MacArthur Field. Combined, those will deliver 300 units of housing that when you add the 900 units of housing we're asking the PD team to deliver, you get to the 1,200. Uh, it is, and I, I highlighted it there, at least 900. So to the question that was raised to the uh, housing authorities here, is 1,200 the right number? Uh, this does give us the ability, and we do have more parcels available to develop more than 1,200 units, and that would go under the PDEUL above that 900 that is there. Okay. Um, there is a parcel release schedule, which is a document that we do make publicly available. It is updated on a quarterly basis. The actual enhanced use lease did have a draft parcel release schedule, but things do change between financing considerations. GLA operations are still in some of those buildings. So as things change, we do want to be transparent with that. So we do publish that parcel release schedule on a regular basis, and it's available on the GLA website. We're due to release an updated one here in the very near future. So you'll get the most recent update at that point. Okay. Okay, you want to go to the next slide. So what are the commitments that VA has made as part of that principal developer EUL? And realistically, there's a couple, and the biggest one is our assets. So land and buildings that are made available to the PD team for redevelopment purposes to convert into the, the housing and the supportive services that are necessary there. We also have the ability to do capital contributions. Capital contribution is something that the EUL statute allows VA to contribute money from our minor construction account to an enhanced use lease developer to help offset the cost for specific things that need to be offset. Uh, example would be historic buildings or buildings in poor condition. If there's a lot of abatement that's needed, that's not necessarily something that they typically get financed through low income, low income housing tax credits or other financing sources. VA has the ability to directly contribute money for a capital contribution to these individual projects. And we've done that on several of the projects here at West LA. The largest one was actually the trunk line work that we did. So going up Bonzel Avenue, bringing in a whole bunch of dry utilities to support the North Campus, 
was a, about a $13 million endeavor that VA contributed directly to the enhanced use lease with the PD team for them to be able to do that work to support the North Campus. So that is another piece. What isn't finite in the enhanced use lease is how much money. Uh, that is a TBD as we go through each of the parcels to be released. That amount is determined of what that cost could be and whether VA has the ability to contribute for that particular parcel. And then we have a commitment agreement that we agree exactly how much and for what purposes we would contribute that money to the PD team for development on that parcel. Okay. So those are the two core pieces. Now it is worth noting in the, the chart on the right, this is what you would see in the parcel release schedule. There's actually 20 parcels that we had identified that could be available for housing purposes. To get to the 900 units, we only need to use about 14 of those parcels. So there are additional parcels that we've already identified as potential use for housing that would take us above that 900 unit. You might hear us refer to those as below the line right now, so not necessarily committed to delivering those housing units, but the parcels are available. And that is another piece that VA is, is committed to as part of the PDEUL. Uh, I think that's about it on this question. So if you get to the next slide. So this question has to do with the memorandum, memorandum of understanding or MOU. Um, did VA state that the principal developer would be responsible for executing town center development? Short answer here is, is that the MOU did require the PD team to plan for and do due diligence for a community. It did not use the term town center, but it did imply that we were asking the PD team to look at the community as a whole and not just the individual housing units to get to the 900 that we're talking about there. Okay, so that, that's an important distinction here. The MOU was not legally binding at the time. So ultimately, the next question you asked was the EUL. So the EUL would supersede anything that was done in the MOU originally, but the MOU was our first opportunity to ask the PD team to take the broader view of how does the housing that we're asking you to deliver fit within the broader community that everyone wanted to deliver here. So the term that we heard earlier today, I think was connectiveness. How does that factor in? We did not want the PD team to say, I can put 50 units here, 50 here, 50 here, and I've met my requirement. How does it all tie together? So we did ask them at the first point of the MOU to have that vision of the community and not just the individual housing units, okay? Uh, but again, it doesn't ask them to execute a town center. So just to be clear, that is not what the MOU said. It looked at the due diligence for the community plan in and of itself, okay? And if you go to the next one, similar question, but specifically about the enhanced use lease that was, so the MOU is outdated at this point, the enhanced use lease is what replaced it. You still will not see a direct reference to executing a town center, okay? That does not exist within the PDEUL. What does exist within the PDEUL is the requirement for the supportive services to go along with the housing. So what we're requiring the PDT to deliver is not housing, it's permanent supportive housing. So there are services that go along with that that we are asking them to deliver specifically, but we've also asked them to continue with that view of the community and help coordinate those services across the community. Not execute, not necessarily deliver all of those services, but help us with the plan to ensure it all touches each other correctly and doesn't end up being 12 or 14 different housing buildings with nothing to go along with that, okay? So this is a, a trickier question when you really get down to it, because it starts with what is the town center? So the town center is not necessarily a thing that you would ask someone to execute. It's a concept, it's a location, it's a central point within the campus, but what exactly goes into making that a town center is TBD. You know, we talked about some of this yesterday, a hotel, could it, could it not fit? We don't necessarily know the answer to that question. I think there's some logical supportive services that go with most housing developments that we would say, of course, that will be there. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do to get to the point of what are all of those things that need to be in that town center concept to make the community work. Uh, some of those things will fall to the PD team because it's a supportive service for the housing directly. It is something directly tied to the residents of the North Campus that they would deliver as part of one of the EULs on the North Campus. 
There will also clearly be things that are not part of the supportive services that fall outside of that. Simplest example, the coffee shop. Coffee shop is not a supportive service for the housing directly. The PD team, we've asked them to say, logically, where does that fit? Where is there space within buildings and within the network of roads and, and pedestrian paths? Where is it likely that a coffee shop would be the most advantageous? We did not ask them to do the coffee shop. VA actually has a great canteen service that can deliver coffee shops and other things like that, or VA could choose to bring in a third party via the service lease component separately. Uh, so we're not asking the PD team to do the coffee shop, but we are asking them to plan for it as they look at all of the buildings and the housing to be developed on the North Campus. So a nuance, but very important when the question is about who we ask to execute, most of those types of things, we've not asked anyone to execute at this point. We're still in that fact finding to figure out exactly what services should be provided, what the veterans want, what they need on the North Campus. But there's clearly a subset of that that we already know that is part of the support of housing that would be developed that the PD team is, is working on and will build into the units. Most of the units that are in place, for example, have a food pantry, okay? That's not a residential unit. It is something that's built into the building to support the residents that are there. That's a supportive service. Um, we don't have to do a service lease for that. It's directly tied to the housing. But there are other things that we heard in this forum and from veteran input before that will not fall easily within that supportive service. And that's where those service leases come in. But where do you put those services? We have to have a plan. We have to have space. We have to have a concept of where that goes. So we have asked the PD team to carve out spaces in different locations for those services. And building 300 will come up here pretty soon. That's a good example of one. Building 300 was proposed with about 15,000 square feet of supportive service space. So it's definitely not all housing. It's bringing in a lot of those services. Um, as we work through the development of building 300, the question is, is what then are those services? Specifically, what are the services there? And then who would actually execute on those? Would it be part of the EUL with the PD team? Would it come back to VA to do if it was a coffee shop or something like that? Or would it be carved out to be a service lease for another purpose that is there? Uh, and we will address those things sort of building by building to figure out what exactly goes there. But we're starting with the concept to create that flexible service space in multiple buildings across the North Campus so that it is available when we do get to the point where we're making those decisions on those specific services. Okay. So with that said, those were the specific questions. I think I've answered the specific questions, and I know that will generate lots more questions. So let's just go ahead and get into that. Thanks, Brett. Thanks for being so uh, direct and responsive to the questions asked. Uh, I'm going to start with just a real clear procedural question um, because I want the board members, especially the new board members, to have an understanding of, of terms of art. So uh, a master plan is something that was done in 2016 and 2022, and VA as an agency authored that master plan, correct? Correct. And when you talk about a community plan, that's something that's called for from the principal developer, and it's a way in which they describe a um, community atmosphere they want to create for the veterans that they'll be housing in permanent supportive housing. Isn't that right? Correct. Okay, so big picture, while we want the principal developer's input on the arrangement of housing, the responsibility of determining where the zones are and what happens in each of those zones is something that resides with the agency, right? Yes, I think that's fair. Okay. So I just, I want everyone to have in mind that while the principal developer can make recommendations about how buildings ought to be used, the master planning function that informs their use is something that has to be decided by the agency with input from us. Okay, because it's her birthday, Stephanie, it's the next question. Isn't that, isn't that dedication? She's your own. Uh, I am. <laughs> Stephanie Cullen. Um, I have a, a whole page written of questions. So I will go until you tell me to stop. Is that fair for now? Let's do five questions. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So my first question is about the parcel release schedule. Um, when is the Q1 parcel release schedule going to be released? 
I would say within the next week, two weeks tops. Okay, and I just want to confirm that at the beginning, the first question you answered, or before you started answering questions, you said that building 408 is pushed to a later timeline, and you said 2025. Um, do you know when in 2025? I, I would say spring. I don't know exactly which month we're projecting, but spring of 25. Okay, and what is the what do you anticipate is going to happen between now and 2025? That is informing that decision to move the parcel and I ask that because obviously we had a recommendation from the last meeting um, around the buildings below Nimitz. Um, and I would like to understand what the process will be on the VAN to assess the options that we have for the town center. Um, whether it is the 2016 plan, the 2022 plan, the ULI plan, where are we going to land before 2025? Is this going to be worked out through a strategic process before additional parcels are released, whether it's in May of this year or 2025 or Q1 or Q2 of 2025? So directly, the, there isn't a link between your recommendation and what happened with it. Indirectly, the ULI study certainly had an impact on it. And ULI brought up a lot of very good components. What I will point out is what is proposed in Master Plan 2022 is a mixed use development approach to the town center. What I will say is the ULI study fully supports that. They directly call out using mixed use to develop that to integrate it. So that was one of the things we were waiting for was that input from a previous recommendation from ULI of do we need to change the paradigm overall? The question about north or south of Nimitz actually goes more to the question of how many total units do we think we're going to need and the question about the south southeast portion uh, of you know the homeless potentially at risk college components. So those are all pieces that we'll be working through that will help drive what would or could not change between now and 2025 when we would release that schedule. Um, so that, that was some of the drivers, but those are also some of the inputs into what we need to go through to figure out the timing and the buildings to be released going forward. Thank you. And is this board going to receive a presentation on what the decision looks like around that strategic planning before contracts are issued with a developer? Uh, well, so I would say, yes, certainly can have a presentation on it. The contracts themselves, if it's going to be housing, would already be part of the PDEUL. All of the other components that would be service leases would be done a little bit differently and separately for actually delivering on those services, wherever those might be. Uh, so, yes, I think you would, but those would be the only contracts issued as a result of those decisions. If we move parcels around, it doesn't change the PDEUL. To just change the parcel release schedule itself. Okay, and I think at the last meeting you were asked if Building 408 was confirmed to be um, developed by the principal development team, and I don't think there was an answer. So I just want to follow up on that. Can you confirm that the principal development team is selected for Building 408? I can confirm that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I read one more. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm not even going to ask another question. I'm just going to make a comment um, about the process because I think that um, we've talked a lot about the difference between the 2016 master planning process and the 2022 master planning process and just understanding what the collaboration and input from stakeholders and veterans really look like for those two processes. Um, it almost seems like in these discussions as we move forward, we're now in 2024, that the 2016 master plan has sort of just been like you guys just scrapped it and put a strike through it. It's really important. I'm not a veteran, but I am on this board because I was part of that process and there were tons of veterans who were there and part of the process. You can't just forget about what happened in 2016 when establishing um, how to reconcile the differences between the 2016 town center concept, the 2022 town center concept and the ULI study. I do you understand why the ULI study was done um, and it's important? So I want to make sure that we just don't forget 
the real stakeholder involved process that happened in 2016 and how important it is to this campus moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, let me just emphasize the point she just made for some of our new board members. This board asked for a third party, the Urban Land Institute, to study the viability of a town center because we thought that in the move from the 2016 master plan to the 2022 master plan, the agency had diluted the vision of the town center. And, and we also had some concern that that was a function of the agency ceding too much of its master planning responsibility to the principal developer and agreeing to the notion that if the principal developer had a community plan for housing, that that was the same as or sufficient constitute a master plan. So I, for one, am very disappointed at the idea that we have to turn over building 408 at this point. And you, you know I've had a long running concern about turning over building 13. About a year ago, uh, when we were briefed on the new version of the enhanced use lease, I specifically asked uh, whoever the briefer was, it may have been you, Brad, but I think maybe someone else, does the framework established by the EUL compel the agency to turn over to the principal developer buildings that are identified in the EUL? In other words, does the EUL framework amount to a right of first refusal so that now the principal developer knows this is his or her to do with before anyone else gets it? And I was told in public session, if I recall correctly, no, it does not. That the agency, even though it may have identified these parcels in the EUL agreement, is free to decide that it's not going to turn them over. So with that as a sermon, I would just say, I would really encourage the agency to think about using its power under the EUL to pull back the parcels that have been identified for principal developer that are in the town center area as originally defined and hold those for the time being, because otherwise we're giving those up for 99 years. Okay, Jim Zenner. We don't want to talk anymore. Yeah. That's Sandor. I, I'm going to ask a question that may not be for you. And so I'm open to being told, I'm, I'm brand new to the board. I'm open to being told this isn't the right form for this question. And I can hold it for whoever can answer it at some point. Um, just a little bit about my background. The first 10 years of my career were spent working for a developer of permanent supportive housing. And we developed some of the largest supportive housing in the country, 652 units in one building, 416 units in one building. I ran the 416 unit building for five years. Um, when, as I'm getting to know the site and what's planned, uh, the concentration of 1,200 units of permanent supportive housing for very vulnerable people in one area is, is I think, unprecedented nationally um, and the, the examples that do exist um, are not great you know when you look at high concentrations and so i i know we're talking a lot about mixed use which i think is really really important for this to feel like a community but what have the conversations been about mixed income and especially on the north campus not the, the segregation of certain in populations in certain areas and those things not being integrated so again this might not be the right the right, you might not be the right person, but I just feel curious about if that's been in the history of the development of deciding where the projects are going to go. If we've been talk also speaking about mixed income, I do understand that 1200 units are focused on a formerly homeless population, but I guess I'm asking going beyond that has there been talk about how you integrate mixed income into the site as well. It's a great question, and I can only answer part of that. So part of the EUL requirement does focus on homeless and at risk for West LA. So the EUL program outside of West LA does have some broader parameters to it. I think you heard Kristen mention that yesterday. Um, the PACTAC expanded our authority to do things beyond housing that would be just a benefit in general for veterans. So outside of West LA, there could be a different conversation, but here, it is very focused on the, the homeless and at risk definition for, for veterans. So specifically other types of housing, um, we can do that, but in different venues. So there's the you know, bridge hall and all the different kinds of sort of more emergency housing. But if you're looking at something that is closer to market rate type housing, there isn't really a good venue to do that under the current authorities that we have here. So it hasn't been necessarily part of the conversation. 
that's Dan or one, one more just to build on that. Not just about market, but low income, affordable. So there's certainly different targets with the different buildings in the different parcels. So you'll hear from the PD team, there's one coming up to 10 that's going to have a section for women veterans. So within there, there but it, it hasn't really been income focused. It's been more about senior disabled, uh, you know, some family based, some for women. It's been more about the different groupings of veterans that might need different types of housing needs, less about the income piece. All right, we'll hear from Dylan. Jim Center. Jim Center, uh, I'm interested to hear about some of the limitations of service leases. So in the ULI report, I think what was mentioned was like a restaurant, hotel, things like that. So with the service lease, could the VA enter into an agreement specifically with an organization to provide those amenities on the campus? Uh, so let me to answer it directly. Yes, we could enter into an agreement with an entity to provide those services on the campus. Absolutely. The question really, I think, Tiffany, you're asking this is, there's an enumerated list of things. How does that requirement fit within that enumerated list? So a restaurant is gonna have the same question that the hotel does. How do you ensure it principally benefits veterans? Nutrition is one of the things as an enumerated thing on a service lease list. I could say a restaurant supports that, but how do you satisfy that principally benefits veteran requirement that also exists out there not related to the service lease specifically, but to everything, all land use, how does it principally benefit veterans? You might be able to get to a yes on that if that restaurant was structured in a certain way. And I had I heard a lot of great conversation on the hotel. Maybe it's not a hotel. Maybe it's something that's more like what they have at, at uh, some of the NTFs or some of the other um, you know, DOD locations that is specifically for service members. Maybe we do one specifically for veterans. That's not really a hotel per se, it's a different you might be able to get there, but that's really the trick. It is whatever the use is you're proposing for that service lease, does it fit within the allowable uses of a service lease on this particular campus? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if Stephanie asked this, I might have missed it, but can can we get 1,200 units north of Nimitz built? Uh, I don't believe so. I, I, I don't believe so. There there could be, it would be close um, because there are uh, 408 being one of them, building 13 being one of them. So there are a number of those. And most of the ones that are currently quote unquote below the line are south of Nellis. So we couldn't just flip. There's one building clearly that we could flip, I think it's 257, but I don't think that gives us enough density if we take out 408 and we take out 13 and some of the others that we've talked about. And uh, is it possible to uh, for the VA to solicit for a separate developer to look at town hall and other amenities on the campus? So again, we could do service leases for those. But to, to Rob's point, ultimately, VA's got to make a decision on what those services are, fully supporting that it's got to be driven by the stakeholders, the veterans. And there's been a lot of input. But whatever those services are, how we go about executing those in most cases is going to be either a direct supportive service to the housing and it falls underneath the VUL and it's done by the PD or it falls outside of it and it'll all be done by service lease provided it fits within the definition. Great, thank you. I think the important piece here is making sure that the stakeholder engagement's right for those type of facilities because you know, it's important to get the opinions of our, our fellow veterans that are on the campus, that live on the campus, but you're also gonna wanna have folks like myself and other veterans who are hiring managers coming up here onto the campus and using the campus, interacting with veterans and their families that are on the campus to really kind of integrate that piece. And uh, if we fail in the stakeholder engagement on that, I think uh, we might not get this right. So Brett, I've got some questions that I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask from a real layperson perspective because that's what I have is a layperson perspective. Um, because I know that for you, um, it's one thing to have Congress give you a leasing authority, and it's a different thing to have Congress give you a funding authority. So I'm going to try to tease these issues out and ask you to share your thinking with the group. Um, so I guess the first thing is, when Congress passes the West LA Leasing Act and it comes up with those service leasing authorities that mirror the original description of the town center, so the stuff we've talked about, nutrition, recreation, socialization, 
Congress says you can enter into these leases, but Congress didn't provide you a separate funding source for those leases, did it? Did not. I'll take it one step further. Under a service lease, the actual VA actually has no ability to contribute to that service lease. 100% funded and operated by whoever you lease with. E well, we can't. We can do that capital contribution. West LA Lease Act didn't give us any money for that either. But it does give us the ability under EULs for permanent support of housing to contribute service leases. We have no ability to contribute to that. Yeah. So let's just um, let, let's just say Corporation A. Let's just assume it's a private corporation. If it wanted to come in and operate a a restaurant on this property under a ground lease under the service lease authority of the West LA Lease Act, the challenge it would face is. Most conventional financing wouldn't want to serve a captive population that's limited to principally benefiting veterans, right? That while we think that's a desirable mission, most market based lenders wouldn't agree to finance that construction, correct? I would agree with that. Okay. So, what I want the board to appreciate is we've got a mismatch here. And it's not a mismatch that's the agency's fault, it's a mismatch. We just haven't told Congress. We need these things married up. Um, so let so let, that's the first example. I guess the second thing I was going to ask you is, we've talked a lot about Building 13, and there's some of us who regard it as one of the real architectural gems, and would like to put a lot of the civic identity of the campus in it. But I also know that you, based on that outline, say, hey, if we if we give it to the principal developer, they can put 24 units on the second floor. And by means of doing that, they can finance the rehabilitation. Um, so, because I think the agency's thinking has evolved on this issue, can you tell us currently how you think that you could split the use of Building 13? So, I, I think what we've been working with the PD team on is if we develop the 24 units of housing, there's a significant amount of service space that would be programmed in there. And the question then becomes is what is that service space? Some of it, and I think what we had envisioned and the PD team would envision is building 13 would serve more of the community service space rather than the building service space. So you wouldn't necessarily in other buildings, you might have a computer room and a food pantry and things like that in almost every building out there. Building 13 would have a lot more communal space that was designed to support the entire North Campus veteran population and beyond that, because that is one of the areas we talked about as having you know, coffee shop or, or restaurant or dining options, but it would also have a very large, like, conference room, for lack of a better term, a gathering area, a grand ballroom type scenario there that is, is not supportive to the housing. It is for the community. So it's a community amenity. Um, how much of that space could be made available is, is sort of the question, but it's a significant amount. Building 13 would be predominantly service space rather than the individual uh, residents. And I want to make sure I understand to take building 13 as an example. Would the principal developer have the fee interest in the second floor and VA would hold the fee interest in the ground floor? If it was those communal uses, like the, I'll just use the restaurant. And I'm not saying restaurant fits within the service lease definition, so my attorneys don't get upset. If you conceived a restaurant that met all of the requirements that you could enter into a service lease. When that building is leased to the principal developer, that square footage would be carved out. VA would retain responsibility and ownership of that space. So your the agency's thinking has evolved on this, I think, because I think when we asked this question about a year ago, the notion was we couldn't split building by floor and intercept the leases. Is that right? We we can do that. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've got this mismatch as you've explained it where congress said you can enter into these service leases to support the town center but we don't have any obvious funding source when i went back and looked at the early work of the federal advisory committee years before i got involved i saw that early on there was a suggestion that we ought to explore chip in act funding uh, for those of you who don't know chip in act was something passed by congress about seven years ago and it allows projects that are on the strategic capital improvement plan to be paid for by private donors. And 
Uh, it's been used on just a few sites around the country, but it's been used pretty creatively, and I trust you can all see the relevance of it here. Um, the, the question I have for you, Brad, is because I know you you studied this gift probably more carefully than anyone within the agency. Could we make some of these town center activities fit within the parameters of the skip so that we could invite third party funding? Uh, the, the quick answer is no. And I, I say that because the end result of the chip in project has to be a donation of that asset to VA and it has to satisfy a VA requirement. So if you're going to use it for a, a, a function that VA doesn't have the authority to operate, you know, I'm just making things up here, but a hotel, VA doesn't have the authority to operate a hotel. Even if someone donated that asset to it, it wouldn't satisfy the, that it meets a VA requirement. There. So that's the challenge with it. They have to donate it and it has to be a, a bona fide VA requirement that they donate. So I need to make sure I understand this is when Congress passes the West LA Leasing Act and says in B1, you're authorized to enter into service leases. And I think it's clear Congress is contemplating creation of a town center on this federal property. Is that not a VA requirement? It is not. That's why it would be a service lease for the third party to do that on behalf of the veteran community, not VA. The lawyers are going to have an argument about this, and I want to be in the room. <laughs> because that... Um, because then we've got a real big mismatch that we either have to resolve or we have to go back to Congress on. Um, I mean, so let me let me get to my my final question for you. So you told us there's this mismatch between what Congress said we can do in terms of a town center and no funding. And I take it your preferred solution is we've got all this recent appropriation from Congress in the form of the enhanced use lease. And so the parties who have entered in, entered into enhanced use lease agreements, like the principal developer, we should go ahead and partner with them. Is that your preferred course to execute the town center? Again, no, because I don't think the town center is a thing that I can say someone in any individual is going to execute. I do think that the town center concept of mixed use for the exact mismatch that you just described. Funding is available to develop and renovate housing. Mixing in the services is the easy way to get the capital to do the building in and of itself. But it doesn't mean the PD is going to be the ones delivering or even responsible for some of those mixed use service offerings that exist predominantly on the ground floor of most of the buildings. I think VA articulating how it's going to hold back some of these assets is super important to us. You know, I think many of us who uh, visited villages at Cabrillo were deeply impressed by what the principal developer accomplished by way of housing. Uh, but we also came away thinking that housing ought to remain their focus and that other activities that we've contemplated for the, the campus uh, ought to be the subject of competitive solicitation. And are there any other questions? Get the rest of her. Uh, Stephanie Cohen. Yeah. Stephanie Cohen, um, I don't have a question. I have one last comment because it would not be right of me to not make the comment and I would lay in bed later tonight and wish that I did. This board was created for a reason and we need to remember that between the board and the VA in these discussions. There has been not a lot of transparency around this topic, which is evident in the ULI report not being released until last week I haven't seen it be published or posted anywhere super public for veterans to read and comment on. I only had a week to read it and I'm on this board that is responsible for this. It's unacceptable and this board is going to hold the VA accountable for these things. We need transparency moving forward when parcels are being released, when parcels are being scheduled, when decisions are being made between the principal development team and the VA. And we will keep making recommendations to that effect in future meetings unless we get some transparency around this process. Thank you. Anybody else? Really appreciate the discussion. Thank you.